when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, our focus now on genes outside of APOE is pretty significant. I don't think Richard and I have ever spoken about this on a podcast, Richard Isaacson, but it's probably something we need to revisit. We're working on a paper right now that will get into some of this stuff, but it turns out that there are a lot of genes that seem to modify the risk of APOE. So anybody listening to this who's been a regular listener to the podcast is undoubtedly familiar with APOE and it's three subtypes, type two, three, and four. And of course you get two of each. So you get two, two genes. So you can have the six possible combinations there. The fourth isoform of that is the high risk one. So if you're a two, four, it seems to more or less be a wash, maybe a slight increase in risk. The three, four seems to be associated with about a two to three fold risk in Alzheimer's disease. And the four, four, probably about an eight to 12 fold or maybe eight to 10 fold increase in risk. But we also know at the individual level that even though everything I just said is true at the population level, it doesn't explain what happens at the individual level because there are some individuals who walk around with four fours who don't seem to get Alzheimer's disease. Or if they do, they get it very late in life and it's indistinguishable from the sort of population variant. So they're not getting this variant where they're being taken over by this disease at the age of 61 or something horrible like that. It turns out that there are a bunch of other genes that we're now starting to understand modify the risk of E4. Some things make it more significant, some things make it less. So there are certain haplotypes of the TOM40 gene that amplify risk. There are certain mitochondrial haplotypes that amplify risk. One of the most exciting genes is the clotho modifier. I think it's KLVS is the modified SNP of clotho that actually seems to erase all of the downside of APOE4. So APOE4 people who have this clotho subtype have baseline risk. So one other thing that I'm now becoming really interested in, unfortunately, the ways to measure these other genes, it's very challenging and we have to do it by brute force today. So we don't yet have a standardized way to do this. So it takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money to take a whole genome sequence and do the search for all of these other subtypes. It takes months. A big step in the right direction here is going to be getting more data and getting those data for less than $20,000 per person. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question is how does someone go about getting those genes tested? Do you have a rough timeline in when that might be more widely available or even less cost prohibitive? Is that years down the road? Is that 10 years longer? It should be sooner. You know, this is a solvable problem. I think this is just about throwing enough dollars at it. And a lot of our patients have actually expressed an interest in this. And a few of them are actually kind of working with Richard Isaacson on ways to potentially speed this up and streamline how it's done. But unfortunately, at this moment in time, whenever we do this, it is a brute force labor intensive exercise that, again, we have the technical chops to be able to do if we could streamline. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. 